Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, we have been going through the Gospel of Luke as a matter of um, walking through the Scriptures. The way we approach um, preaching the Scriptures is to do so what's called expositionally or exegetically, which means that instead of cherry-picking verses here and there and sort of doing a topical thing where we're preaching on different passages and things all over the place or me trying to come up with something really eloquent and interesting, because I'm not very eloquent and interesting, and because this is God's Word that we're talking about here, we thought it's better to walk through things systematically, go through an entire book at a time. Let's look at each verse in the book. And what you find is, is that you end up covering all of the things anyway, right? So that and the fact that you cover some things that you probably wouldn't if you were selecting verses week by week, passages, uh, things that don't often come up in the scriptures that you don't think about, we need to preach through this. We do, and praise the Lord. Um, if something makes you mad this morning, whenever we read it, it's not me, it's just the next passage of scripture, okay? So I'm not coming down on you. I'm kidding, that's a joke. You can laugh. It's okay, this is a fun time. Um, we're looking at Luke chapter 13. As we have been walking through the Gospel of Luke, we are watching Jesus as he is beginning to make his turn in his ministry to go toward Jerusalem. This is the general context of what we're seeing here. As he is doing that, he is still up in Galilee making his rounds, but with the intention of making that turn to start going down to Jerusalem. This is going to be his last trip to Jerusalem. Because Jesus is not going down to celebrate the Passover again necessarily. He's not going down to to the Feast of Booths or one of the other festivals that happens in Jerusalem, he is going down to make atonement for the sins of all of his people that he is going to die um, in order to experience the wrath of God upon himself. He is going as a sheep to the slaughter. He is going as the perfect Passover lamb who is without spot, without blemish, who is offering himself up for the sins of his people. He is going to make atonement, to satisfy the wrath of God against His people, as we talked about this morning, so that we may inherit His righteousness for the purpose of being rescued, being redeemed. And so that's Jesus' purpose. That's what we're seeing here. But in the midst of His time, the other context that we see, especially in this particular passage, is the context of how Jesus is speaking about the apostasy of the Jewish people. How he came into his own. And as we talked about, maybe um, you've read as part of your Christmas readings during this time, or Advent readings, in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it talks about how Christ, he came into his own, but his own rejected him. And that's what we're going to see as focused when Jesus is speaking to his people. Throughout this passage, we've seen it happen a number of times. Jesus talking about the narrow door versus the wide door. Talking about the last being first and those who are first being last. Speaking of the Jewish people who were first given the revelation of, of the law and the prophets and, and the scriptures were the ones who rejected him. Meanwhile, the Gentiles who were without the law, who were without the covenants, without the upbringing in the church, so to speak, are the ones who are going to be coming in before the Jewish people because of their rejection. We talked about how Jesus looked at a fig tree, and there, or he told a parable of a man who was looking at a fig tree that was not producing any fruit. It was planted by the master, it was intended to produce the fruit, but the fruit never came. And so therefore, give it one more season, but if it still doesn't produce fruit, cut it down. And so that's the context that we see, and Jesus is now turning to that context again as we speak, or as he speaks in these three or four or five verses <laughs> that we're going to be looking at this morning. So 31 to 35, let's read this morning. It says, at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, I love this. Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, 
I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I, or would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give us insight and understanding into the scriptures today. I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in our midst, convicting us of all, all of us, of sin and righteousness and in judgment. Open our hearts and our minds, open our ears to receive your word today, to apply it to our lives, Lord. I pray that the conviction of the Holy Spirit may come upon us and give us understanding, teaching us where we ought to repent in our lives, and revealing the scriptures to us this morning as we, as we study this passage. Pray, Lord, that you would give me the words to speak. When you're finished, close my mouth. But in all things today, whether I stumble over every single word, or whether I'm able to articulate this message clearly, regardless, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in all things. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus laments over Jerusalem. That's the main focus of this passage of Scripture this morning. Jesus is lamenting over Jerusalem. As I mentioned, he's in Galilee still. And in the Galilee region, there is a, there's a man by the name of Herod. Now, there are several people named Herod in the scriptures, uh, so it's a little confusing. And Herod the Great, and there's Herod Agrippa, and there's Herod Antipas, and there's this other Herod, and all these different people, okay? And so this particular Herod is a tetrarch, one of the four ruling uh, Herods, or, or kings, or governors, or whatever you would call them in this area, and he is over Galilee. This is the same Herod who had put John the Baptist to death. Okay, so I want you to have that in your mind. So this is the same Herod. He's already a murderer. He's already breathed threats out against God and his purpose and his plan to establish his kingdom. He already killed the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist. And now we see some people coming to Jesus to warn him, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. What's interesting about this passage of scripture are the people who are coming to warn him. These are not usual people who are thinking of Jesus in a positive way. These are not the kind of people who have been work, talking with Jesus and have been his friends during this time. Uh, the most unlikely of people come to Jesus to warn him is a bunch of Pharisees. These are the ones that Jesus has already gotten into several altercations with, and he is, they, they, they have uh, uh, accused him of casting out demons, because he himself is serving the chief of demons. Uh, they've, they've opposed him as he has healed people on the Sabbath. Uh, they have opposed him. Um, uh, it was a, a Pharisee's house where Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan to, to sort of shame that particular Pharisee. So there's already been a lot of confrontation. So that brings up the question, what was the intent of these Pharisees? It's interesting, as I was studying this week, there are multiple um, viewpoints as to what's happening here. Some people say that Herod is the one who actually sent the Pharisees. He's telling the Pharisees, go to Jesus, tell him to get out of here. I want him out of my region, so tell him if he doesn't get out of here, I'm going to kill him. Okay? Some people think that the Pharisees were lying. <laughs> they wanted Jesus out of the region. And so they're the ones coming to him. Uh, let's tell him that Herod wants to kill him, and that'll get him out of here. Another viewpoint was that um, uh, uh, the G, they, were, they had the intention of, of speeding Jesus along to his murder, to his accomplishment. If they wanted to kill him, so they knew he would get killed down in Jerusalem, so they're trying to usher him on to that plan. And then the last one was just simply that these Pharisees actually had Jesus' best interest in mind. They heard that Herod did want to kill him, and they really were intent on warning him against that. 
Now we know that Jesus knows the hearts of all men, right? It says that earlier even in the Gospel of Luke, that, that he knew the hearts of all men, and often when people would come to him with trapping questions or in order to set them up or conflict or things along those lines, he would call them out on it. He would rebuke them for it. What I think is interesting is here we don't actually see a rebuke coming from Jesus. We don't see him saying something like, yeah, I hear you saying that, but I know your real intent. I think there's a real possibility that these Pharisees actually care. Not every Pharisee that Jesus had contact with was actually contrary to him. In fact, one great example is when Jesus um, uh, has a visitor <laughs> or, you know, in the middle of the night in John chapter 3, a guy by the name of Nicodemus. It's a very positive conversation with him. Now he calls him out on some misunderstandings of things, but we also know that Nicodemus later defended Jesus in the Sanhedrin whenever he was brought before the council when they were bringing all their false accusations against him. Nicodemus stood up for Jesus. We also know that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret follower of Christ. He was a Pharisee. He gave him his own tomb whenever he died. Not every Pharisee was contrary to Jesus, even though most of them were. And in fact, as he goes more toward Jerusalem, it's almost like you got your country Pharisees and then you got your city folk, you know. Those city folk are the ones that really give him the trouble. Now, he still has some problems with some country Pharisees, but once he gets down to Jerusalem, that's where the real conflict happens. And of course, he is going to die in Jerusalem at the end of the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests and the lawyers. But, I think in this particular case, these people were genuine. They really cared. And I thought about that this week as I think, how often do we quickly jump to conclusions about people? I saw the word Pharisee, I, I'm saying this for myself, I saw the word Pharisee and so I just assume, oh, they're malevolent here, they've got some bad intention here, because I saw the word Pharisee and I just assumed it. And as I read through commentaries and looked and researched and studied, there's a lot out there that says no. I mean, from the textual indication, but they don't seem to have any ill intent here. And so it reminded me that we ought to be quick to, or to, um, uh, 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 to show grace, quick to, to, to show um, uh, giving the benefit of the doubt. I think of in the love chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 7, it mentions that love believes all things. It bears all things. So in other words, love, scriptural love, gives the benefit of the doubt before jumping to conclusions. That was real convicting for me this week. And this was a good reminder. I see Pharisee, I immediately think bad things. But that's not what it was. They actually had his... Um, well-being intention. And so that was that's an application of that particular passage. I think. So they're coming to Jesus. They say, get away from here. Herod wants to kill you. He already has a history of being a killer. He was a murderer, okay? Um, and then Jesus responds, which is the greatest, like, John Wayne type response to these folks. You go tell that fox, okay? You tell him. You tell him this. Today, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. You tell that fox. Jesus had strong words for Herod. Some might think, did Jesus sin here by calling Herod a fox? Was that mean of Jesus to call Herod a fox? And as I thought about that week, that this week, I thought, sometimes some people need to be called foxes. The word fox here has an idea of being deceptive, being immoral, you know, being crafty and sneaky and all of these things. All of these accurately describe Herod and who he was. I think about how we often in our culture will use language to sort of clean up behaviors. We'll say things like, they had an affair. They didn't have an affair. They committed adultery. You see? We'll say things like, hooking up. They didn't hook up. They committed fornication. You see? Oh, that, that's just the way God made me. 
No, well, I mean, no, God didn't make you that way. You, you're that way all on your own. Actually, maybe you're, you're brash or prideful, and you need to be changed by God because of that. How we often clean things up. We say niceties and things along those lines, and in doing so, we often cover up the real problem, you know? They say, oh, he's got a drinking problem or alcoholism or disease instead of calling a person a drunkard. That's what the scripture uses. That's what the scripture says. See, I think it was Buddy Bachman that says, the 11th commandment in evangelical, church, evangelical churches is, thou shalt be nice, right? And so we mistake being nice with being loving. It was appropriate. It was right. In this particular case, for Jesus to say about Herod, that man's a fox. He's crafty. He's evil. He's deceitful. He's a murderer. He's immoral. And it needed to be said. And so Jesus is saying basically, that fox doesn't get to come and tell me what to do. Today, I'm performing, performing cures. I'm healing diseases. I'm, I'm casting out demons. I'm doing that today. And I'm doing it tomorrow. And then when the third day comes, I'll wrap it up. And I'll get out of here. But that dude, Herod, he doesn't get to come and tell me what I'm going to do with my ministry. Because Jesus, he gets his marching orders from a much higher authority than Herod. He gets his marching orders from God the Father. Jesus is being led by the Holy Spirit. And a good application of this passage of Scripture is to remind us that those who would call themselves authorities over us, who do not um, uh, uh, act in accordance with the Scriptures, who may command us to do something or lead us to do something that is against the higher authority of Scripture in my lives. We ought not to pay attention to them. We ought to pay attention to Scripture. For example, you work a job and you have an employer who asks you to do something immoral, something that goes against what the Scriptures have to say. Your obligation is to deny the commandment of your employer and to obey the commandment of Scripture, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if it means you might lose your job. If the government is forcing you to do something that is against what the Scriptures say, you have a right and a duty to disobey the government in order to obey God. See, Herod is the political figure here. He is the government in this example. And he's telling Jesus, get out of here or I'm going to kill you. And Jesus says, go ahead and try it. I'm not leaving because I have a work to do. I have marching orders from God that I will obey first before I obey you. Notice, there's a threat on Jesus' life. This isn't just some, you know, I'm scared of this guy and, or, or I, I'm uncomfortable here. It's... There's a threat against this life, and yet Jesus is willing to stand and be obedient to God the Father first before he is obedient to Herod. Now, this does not subvert the fact that we ought to, you know, uh, submit to governing authorities in the sense that when they are in their proper place obeying God, we also ought to obey them. Yes, that is absolutely true. If a police officer pulls you over, you should stop, okay, and be respectful and do all, all of these things, okay? But that also means that if the government is doing something against what the scripture says, your duty is to obey God over the government, okay? Employers or any other authority figure that's in your life. But then he says it again. He sort of repeats it, but in a different way. Nevertheless, in verse 39, uh, 33, sorry, um, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish from Jerusalem. But don't you worry, Herod. In three days, I'm out of here. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't get all in a bunch, okay? You just don't worry yourself. I'm, I'll leave, but not until my time is done, okay? But I am going to get out of here. Because what he does then is he gives a forecast of his passion. Throughout the scriptures, we see as Jesus is walking amongst the people, as he's speaking to his apostles and the other disciples, as he's teaching, he's talking constantly about his mission and his purpose. 
His mission and his purpose was not at this time to overthrow the Roman government. It was not at this time to establish some political kingdom to be the political Messiah that would rescue Israel from the Romans and things along those lines. His purpose in this one was to come and be the atonement for our sins. He was to give himself as the propitiation, satisfying the wrath of God against us and our sins. And that's what he says. I'm going to leave here when my job is finished here to continue my mission that I'm going to complete, which is to go down to Jerusalem because there I'm going to die. When he says, for um, it is impossible or uh, it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem, he's speaking of himself in a third person context. He is the a prophet in this case. You see what I'm saying? Uh, he's not saying that every prophet that has ever existed from God must die in Jerusalem. That's not what he's saying. But he's referring to himself in the third person. Much like Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians what is it, 12, I think, when he talks about, I knew a man who was caught up to the third heaven. He's talking about himself. Okay? He's, he's speaking of himself in the third person. That's what Jesus is doing here as well. Moses didn't die in Jerusalem. Jeremiah didn't die in Jerusalem. Daniel, Ezekiel, they all they died in you know Babylon. You know, so so there were many prophets that didn't die in Jerusalem. So he's not saying that that's the case, but what he's saying is that he must die in Jerusalem. So in other words, he's got nothing to be worried about with Herod. Herod can't touch him. Even though Herod is trying to breathe threats out and trying to flex his muscles and exercise his authority, he has no authority to do that. Because Jesus says, I, I can't die here. It's not in the plan of God. It's not in the purpose of God. A prophet, me, must die in Jerusalem. See? That's the point. He's saying, my God who's sovereign, is going to take care of this thing. And there's nothing that's going to thwart his plan for my life. And I will accomplish it according to his providential will. That should be terribly, terribly comforting to us in this room. We serve a sovereign God who is sovereign over all things. He knows every uh, hair on your head. Uh, he's, he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. And he says, you're way more important than sparrows, and yet I know all about them. He's sovereign over you and your life. In Acts chapter 17, Bill, I think, already mentioned it this morning, that he knows the boundaries of our habitation. He knows the day that we, die, that we were born. He knows the day that we will die. He knows all the events in between. He has placed us where he has placed us, according to his providential, his sovereign will. And though we live according to what the scriptures say, and we do things, you know, to keep our health up and wear our seatbelt and things along those lines, we don't, we don't presume on the grace of God. Yet at the same time, He is 100% sovereign over every aspect of our lives. And that's a comforting thing. Because the one who loves us most is the one who is also sovereign over every event in our life. That also means that whenever the tough things happen, when the bad things happen, when the harsh things happen in our lives, He's sovereign over that too. And there must be a reason and a purpose for why He's bringing those things together. I think of, of that verse in Romans chapter 8. God works all things together for good for those who love Him and who are called in according to His purposes. Okay, It doesn't just stop at He works all things for good. He does that for the sake of His people. Which means that even the difficult things in our lives, even the troublesome things in our life. Even the moments in our life are like, God, why won't you take this away from me? It must be there for our good and for his sovereign purpose. Because he is sovereign over all things. Herod had no power or authority at all to touch Jesus. It wasn't going to happen. I'm here for three days, and I'm out. Because Herod can't do a thing to me. Moving on. Since he goes with this idea of Jerusalem, and since this whole passage of Scripture, the context of it, has been largely regarding the rejection of the Jewish people 
from his teaching in him as the Messiah, he, since he's on the subject of Jerusalem here and in this context, gives what's known as a lament for Jerusalem. A lament for Jerusalem. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. We've seen that in passages of Scripture before. Absalom, Absalom. Mourning the loss of his son, David says his name twice. Oh, Absalom, Absalom. Jesus is mourning Jerusalem here. He's lamenting over the city. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. He's lamenting the fact that he has come into his own. He has come into his people. He has come with the gospel and with the teaching that has come from God to his people to be the Savior. And his own people rejected him. His own people uh, denied him. Now we know, of course, there's a remnant that did not. You know, his disciples here, his apostles, they're all Jews. So all the people he's talking to here are Jews. We know that on the day of Pentecost, the whole church gathering that happened, the 3,000 that were saved and all those who repented, that Pentecost was a Jewish festival at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and multitudes of people were saved. The church began in Jerusalem. The church began among the Jewish people. Okay, So we're not saying that every single Jewish person rejected Christ. Of course that's not the case. Jesus himself was a Jewish person by you know nationality, by birth. What we are saying is by and large the nation has rejected him. And so that's what we see here. When Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he's not speaking of like the city proper with just the inhabitants there. The Jerusalem here is representative of the nation of Israel. And it's more than just this time now, if you think about it. It is the course of their history. Throughout the course of the history of the Jewish nation, throughout the course of Israel, they have been a people who have repeatedly rejected the one who chose them and, and transferred them out of Egypt and into the promised land. The very night that Moses is getting the law of God on the top of Mount Sinai, they build a golden calf and start worshiping it. Ten times throughout the, the wilderness wanderings, it says that, and then they rebelled, and then they murmured, and then they rejected God again. Throughout the time of the judges, you see this cycle of apostasy. They reject God, reject God. God hands them over to these uh, uh, people from outside, the Philistines, the Moabites, the whomever that they were supposed to drive out and they didn't. And then they're under oppression and they call back out to God and then he rescues them and it just cycles through. And then we thought if we only had a king, we wouldn't do this sort of thing. So God gives them a king and they keep doing it. The kingdom splits under Rehoboam. The northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes that went with them, almost completely rebelled. Very few saved up in the northern kingdom. They rejected him. They rebelled. God handed them over to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom, they started to reject him. They started to rebel. He handed them over to the Babylonians. Seventy years he handed them over. We get the, to, uh, the gospel, Psalm 137, which is the lament over handing over. We have the whole book of Lamentations, an entire book that's about the lament of the destruction of Jerusalem, the handing over to these people and the rebellion. He brings them back to the land. They do good for a while, and then they develop this religiosity system, and they reject the, the, uh, uh, um, the heart and the substance of the law and replaced it with a Judaistic, works-based, religious sort of system. So now Jesus comes into that system, and they reject him too. And so that's what Jesus is saying. The city that kills the prophets, God sends them prophets. God sends them people to repent, repent, repent. Turn away from these false idols. Turn back to me. Be saved. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, let us reason together. Come back to me. And they continually reject him. Over and over and over again. Praise God, 
He kept a remnant. Praise God, there were revivals that happened from time to time. Not everybody was lost. There were many people who loved him. But once again, by and large, as a nation, his people that he called out for himself. And so we have it here. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. I kept cultivating this relationship. And there's scriptures in the Old Testament that talks about God almost like describing it as, as you know, Ronan and maybe like 10 months, 11 months when you start grabbing her fingers and you start walking her and she starts to learn how to walk. And this is that the felt way that God is saying, like, I, I raised you up like a little child. I taught you how to walk. I fed you in the wilderness. I raised you. I cultivated this relationship with you. I did everything for you. And you rejected me. I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her brood. But you would not. Even though I sent prophets and kings and teachers, even though I led you with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud in the wilderness, even though I did all of these things for you, I literally grabbed you out of bondage and slavery and set you free. And you rejected me. And you rejected me. You would not. Now, I think it was Sproul that said, they would not because they could not. And they could not because they would not. <laughs> I love Sproul's way of putting things. Free will is corrupted in human nature by sin. We have free will to an extent. The free will that we have has a fallen under the corruption of sin as we have as we have um, uh, uh, rebelled against God. It, it's Free will is a free choice without coercion. That's what free will genuinely is. So a truly free choice. So, so if I hold a gun to your head and I say, you uh, pay me $50 or I'm going to shoot you, okay? By your free will, you gave $50? Well, sort of. <laughs> you gave $50 because you didn't want to get shot in the head. You see... The free will has been coerced by something else. Therefore, that will has become bond, you know, put in bondage, you see. The same thing has happened with us. Adam and Eve had true, pure free will. I'll put you in the garden. You don't eat this fruit. The day you eat of it, you'll die. They ate the fruit by their own free choice and plunged us into a world of rebellion. We have a sin nature that we have inherited, and dwelling sin within each of us now has corrupted and coerced our free will. So, they would not because they could not. In their corrupted free will, they didn't want God. And in fact, all of us, in our corrupted free will, it says there's none who seeks after God. None of us goes after him. None of us chooses Christ. Because our will has been corrupted. And in our sinfulness, we don't want Christ. Just as they didn't want him. So they would not because they could not. And they could not because they would not. Because in their sinfulness, they actively chose to rebel against so the only person, a person, a way a person can be rescued is if something overcomes our corrupted free will. And that is the grace of God that comes. The Holy Spirit that regenerates us and gives us grace in order to choose Christ. It is impossible for us to choose Christ on our own outside of the work of the Holy Spirit drawing us to Him. And those whom He will draw, He will save. So what is this business about you wouldn't let me gather you and I wish I would I would have gathered you. The idea is I've done all these things for you and yet you still reject me. Now, in any moment in time, God could have chosen to elect more people, you see. 
but God in his business and the way he handles things, the, 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 the door is narrow. We read about that last week. That leads to life. I don't know why he chooses whom he chooses, but he does so by his grace. The real question is, why would he choose anybody if he is so holy and we are so redundant and so sinful? So praise God that he does save some. All right, verse 35. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, because of that utter corruption, because of that utter rebellion, because of their forsaking of Christ, God is done with them. Behold, your house, that's the temple, it's also just the house or the household of Israel. Think about that. That's you know, we say it's for me and my house. That's, that means my family structure, my unit, my patriarchy. You know, that what has begun with Israel, Jacob, and the twelve sons born to him. Jacob's house, the house of Israel, is forsaken. Okay? And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, this is a very short little thing I just wanted to bring up since we're here on the subject of this. This is what Jesus is indicating here is the time that the Romans are going to come and destroy Jerusalem. And they're going to destroy the temple. Okay? What we have here is there's this time, we'll call this Moses. All right? The initiation of the Mosaic Covenant happened on Mount Sinai. And that's the covenant that here, if we look at this as a timeline, um, this is the return of Christ. Okay? We've got a whole timeline here. And this is Jesus's, what I would say, his inauguration. And I'm sure I spelled it wrong, but I'm on the spot. So, <laughs> Jesus comes and he inaugurates the kingdom of God. But there's a short period of time that happens between when he's coming in and inaugurating the kingdom of God, making atonement and establishing a new covenant, a covenant that is in his blood, his broken body, that which we're going to celebrate in a few minutes here as we take communion together. There's this time that happens in 70 AD. AD 70, sorry, I always do that. Um, where the temple is destroyed and where Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans. So this is the temple destroyed. Sorry if you can't see it back in the back. Maybe you can hear what I'm saying. So what's interesting here is that we have this, this period of time. This is the old covenant here, and this is the new covenant here. Okay? And so we see that there, the old covenant, the Old Testament, the that which was given, the, the sacrificial system, the tabernacle, all of the law and the prophets and all the things that are established under Moses, is destroyed in 70 A.D. You see, A.D. 70. It's destroyed. The remnants of the Old Covenant are gone. The New Covenant, which is inaugurated by Christ and His blood and His atonement, continues on until His return. But there is this short period in between here where the Gospel is going out to the world and, and then as the Gospel establishes and the Church is established throughout the Roman Empire, you will be my witnesses and Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's happening. And then God takes out the remnants of the old covenant. And basically what he's saying is, we don't pay attention to this anymore in the sense of adhering to it. We, of course, pay attention to the Old Testament, okay? But we don't hold to the old covenant anymore. We don't bring sacrifices to the temple. We don't do these things. Now it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Christ has come, he's established a new covenant, the covenant of his blood, and that is where we are now. The old covenant is obsolete, it's gone. <coughs> so that's what he's saying. Behold, your house is forsaken, that will destroy. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what that saying is, is all of your system is obsolete and it's all about me now and until I come back 
That's, that's you know, you're going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord at the return. He's talking about his return there. Now, when it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, we read that this morning in Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is a psalm of ascent. It was a, a psalm of, of worship going up into the temple. It was, it was entering into the temple. That's the idea. So what Jesus is saying is here. Jesus is going to enter in back into his temple, so to speak. This is his return. And that's when they who rejected him now are going to recognize him as the Messiah. You see what I'm saying? This is all making sense now. He's going to be understood, but probably from a Philippians chapter 2 sense. Therefore, every tongue will confess whether heaven and earth under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They rejected him now and because of that their house is forsaken. But one day blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will see he was the one. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And so this is a uh, he's lamenting because he's saying your time is up, just like with the parable of the fig tree. You're about to be destroyed. Your house is forsaken. And just like the Babylonians came and destroyed at one time, now the Romans are going to come and destroy it forever. Because it's not about the temple anymore. It's not about the tabernacle. It's not about the Mosaic law anymore. It's about Jesus Christ. And it's about him establishing his covenant, his kingdom, which he will then one day come back and completely fulfill all things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your scriptures this morning. This is a interesting passage this past week to study, and I pray that I did it justice, but in the gap that is happening between me and understanding and preaching this morning, I pray you will fill with understanding from the Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word and what it means to us. We thank you for um, all that you have done. We pray that you would take these words and apply it to our heart and our minds. We look forward to the day when you will return. We praise you, Lord God, that though one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess, but we thank you, God, that by your grace you have brought us out and you have given us grace to willingly bow our knee down and already recognize you as Lord. God, the great blessing that comes from that. We ask you now to prepare our hearts and our minds to celebrate this sacrificial meal with you, Lord, as we enter into our time of communion. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.